Everybody quiets now. Hi, I'm Reza Shadmer. Welcome, guys. This is a new course that um, I started this year to um, cover some of the basic um, foundational ideas about the way to analyze data, the way to model things in biomedical engineering. And um, the course is called Mathematical Foundations of BME. I'm glad you guys signed up. It's wonderful to see all of you. I think almost all of you are graduate students. Um, our, our TA is Eson. Eson is sitting in the front. And uh, this course is, um, almost all of it is available on the um, lecture uh, notes that you see here at, this, at our website, uh, shadmerlab.org, courses, math found. And um, that's where you'll find all the homeworks and um, data sets. That's where we'll post the uh, um, exams from previous years so you can see, you know, what are the things you need to study and so forth. But today what I want to do is um, go over what the course is going to cover. And once we do that, we'll then get into some of the stuff that we're going to do. So this course is, is all about you doing homework. You actually trying your hands on this material that we're going to be discussing during the class. So this is a homework-based grading system. So our grading is going to be like this. So let me write down how we're going to grade the course. So your homeworks are going to be 40% of your grade. And you will have a homework every lecture, almost every lecture. And what that means is that the homeworks are due each Tuesday. So typically, you will turn in two homeworks every Tuesday at the beginning of the class. And what that means is that your homeworks can be printed or emailed to Eson, to this Gmail account that uh, I have listed up, up high. Um, so our homework is going to be worth 40% of our grade. And as I said, homeworks are really the time for you to learn what we're talking about in class. The theory that I'll present in class, you get to try it using the homeworks. And uh, there are also uh, a couple of tests. So we'll have a midterm, which will be 30% of your grade. And that's March 15. It's the last day of class before spring break. The final is another midterm. Midterm 2, which is also 30% of your grade. And the university sets the, the, the date for that. And that will be 9 AM Thursday, May 17, just during the finals week. Um, the, the room for that, I'm not sure. Probably be here if the room is available, but, but we'll see. OK. The tests, all tests, are open note. And I will describe it to you. So you'll be allowed to bring in one piece of paper with as much notes on it as you like. And the idea is that you'll have the opportunity to summarize basically the course for yourself on that piece of paper. And I, when I was a graduate student, that was a very useful thing for me to do, was to write down the things that I learned on that you know, half of the semester on a piece of paper. So you can bring a piece of paper with you to have as much as you like on both sides of the paper. You can, you can write your notes. So basically, there's no need to memorize any equations or anything like that. You can just bring it with you. Um, so open notes. Now, uh, any questions about homework midterms? We will not have any late no late homework accepted for any reason, but we will drop two lowest grade homeworks. So, you know, if you have some place to go, you have a conference, something's happened, you can't finish the homework, it's okay. It's not a big deal. We're going to drop two lowest homeworks anyway. All right. Hmm. Let's see why. I wonder if there's a way for me to. Just write down. Let me put a little line here. 
now we can go a little bit farther up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so a little bit about the TA policy. So you can ask questions. So ask questions until 8 p.m. the day before homework is due. So we'll do our, our best to answer your questions, but you know, give us a little bit of time. So don't don't wait until two hours before the homework is due before you ask the question. Do it a little bit earlier. I mean, my suggestion is really, you know, when that you should start on the homework the day that we discuss the material, but you'll have a week, you know, to do it. Um, you'll get grades from zero to ten for every homework, and uh, we ask that please comment your code. You're going to be writing MATLAB code for a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about, although really any language is okay, but that's the language I would expect most of you guys to use. Um, a little bit about integrity I wanted to tell you. So it's really important that the homework be your own work. So it is perfectly fine to form groups to study together and to think about the homework, but when it comes to writing the code that you're going to be doing, writing the equations that you're going to be handing in, it has to be your work. So I ask you to take this seriously, collaborate with each other, but when it comes to actually turning it in, writing the material, it should be your own work. If you work with others in coming up with ideas, please specify your group. So, you know, if you work with a group of two or three people to solve some problem, let us know. Uh, so when we look at the, you know, the work that you did, we have a sense of, you know, what were the groups that did it. And if all of you guys made the same mistake, we can have a sense of it. But if it's clear to us that somebody wrote the code and somebody copied the code, that's an infraction. And I, and I will take that very seriously you will then both both the person you know we don't know who copied from whom anymore in that scenario so both will get zeros for that homework and a five percent deduction from your grade for the course so copy code zero and minus five percent deduction for course and I, I, I hope that then it will never be repeated. If it is repeated, you'll be removed from the class. So integrity, very important. Um, I will post online on the, web, on the course webpage uh, further instructions about what I expect from you guys in terms of integrity when you do your homework. I, I want you to learn, basically. And, and look, um, uh, I, I honestly expect all of you guys to do well in the course. I hope to give A's to everybody in this class. And it's just a matter of, uh, you know, you guys trying. And hopefully, by trying, you will succeed. Okay, any questions about this bureaucratic detail before I start with the course? All right. Hopefully you'll ask more questions as we go through the class, because otherwise it'll be a dry, sad kind of a lectures. I won't let it go that way anyway. You'll have to ask questions. All right. Um, let me see if I... Hmm. All right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm learning this as we go, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. I apologize for my uh, all right so let's go over topics of the course that we're going to be covering so we're going to start with supervised learning and what is supervised learning 
basically means our data are labeled. We have some inputs, x. We have some labels, y. And we want to learn a map that says, if x, from x, I want to be able to tell you my estimate of what the label would be, the y hat. And today, so today we're going to learn a simple uh, supervised learning rule, and it's going to be called perceptron. Perceptron rule. And um, what you're going to do for your homework is to apply the perceptron rule to learn to make predictions from some Netflix data. So, you know, in Netflix, what, what, it, what they try to do is to look to see what movies you watch, and then based on the features of the movie, learn to make predictions about the kind of movies you, you should watch, the kind of movies they should suggest to you. So, you're going to be given some data that describes features of movies, and then whether this person in its history liked or disliked it, and then you're going to use that to build a uh, system that makes predictions for the future. And we're going to use the perceptron rule to do it. And I'll go over the rule with you to see what, it, what it's about. It's a binary task that you're going to learn. Um, it's going to be like and dislike, and the features are also going to be binary. You know, 10 features, yes or no, for each one of the features of the particular movie. And then you're going to build a system that uh, maps features of a movie to whether this person is going to like and dislike. And we're going to use perceptron rule to, to do it. Um, you also have a extra credit homework today. And that extra credit homework is about features that go with handwritten text. So there's going to be some data that you're going to see that is going to describe um, handwritten letters, like numbers in this case, from 0 to 9. And um, you're going to also apply this, this uh, perceptron rule that I talked about to do hand letter, handwritten letter recognition. So that would be the extra credit. That's a little bit more challenging. And uh, for those of you who are a little bit more um, interested in this, you can try it with that. So that's supervised learning. Supervised learning is about taking inputs X labels Y, somebody gives it to you. They're supervised in the sense that there's a teacher. So you have the data already that's labeled. And from that, you learn to make uh, predictions. And in the case of um, binary inputs, binary outputs, perceptron rule is a reasonable place to start. After we learn about supervised learning, we're going to learn about um, a regression where the problem now is that our input space and our output space are real valued quantities. So in regression, things that you've already seen a lot, you know, when you fit a line to something, you take a real valued input x and you make predictions about some other real valued uh, quantity y. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about regression using statistical techniques, things that will tell us, like, how confident are you about the parameters that you estimated. So when you estimated the slope, and when you estimated the, in a, in a multidimensional case, you'll have many weights associated with the inputs and the outputs. How confident are you about the estimates that you made? And so then you learn things like when you plot your data with you know, standard errors, what is the relationship between that standard error and the concept of a confidence associated with a parameter value? Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about a loss function. And the idea of a loss function is that what you're going to have is some measure of how goodness, how good you have fit the data. And a loss function gives you an objective measure of your goodness of fit. And a typical loss function is something that says, look at all your data, compare the actual value minus what you predicted, and normalize it. 
put a norm to it. So if this is scalar values, we could just square it and say we have n data points. This would be a typical loss function. And what we're minimizing is the mean squared error. So this is the difference between label the teacher's input and my estimate. So the difference between that is the error. So that's a typical loss function. And an algorithm that will learn that minimize such loss function is called LMS least mean squared. And some of the techniques that will help us in learning this are newton raphson which are basically a fast way to find the optimum model parameters. So we're still in the world of regression. So regression is, again, going from real valued inputs to real valued outputs and building models that go from one to the other. Now, the statistical problem of representation is the beginning of the next set of lectures that you're going to see. And our next one is going to be maximum likelihood. So what is maximum likelihood? In maximum likelihood, what you have is that we have some data, which I'm going to write with a capital D, and we have some model parameters. which I'm going to call theta. And what maximum likelihood is, ML, is to find theta that maximizes the probability of the data given our parameter theta. So maximum likelihood means to find the parameters theta that maximize the probability of seeing the data that you saw. And that's what maximum likelihood does, is describes a function that says, here's the probability of what my data is, given that I have some parameters theta, and then I'm going to find the optimum theta for that. And which means now we begin to think about describing our data in a probabilistic way. So we have to have models of noise models of uncertainty that say, well, how, you know, how is this thing that I'm measuring related to these parameters that might have generated that data? And maximum likelihood is a way to, op to find, basically, the data that, uh, uh, that's best represented by the parameters, the parameters that are going to give you um, optimizing this likelihood. OK, so um, the next couple of lectures are on the Fourier analysis, and power spectrum estimation. So this is a really important set of techniques that are used in signal processing. in particular applications to image processing. So any of you guys that are in imaging labs, this would be one of your bread and butter, would be Fourier analysis of data. So we'll, we'll have a couple of lectures on Fourier analysis. The next set of lectures will be on estimation theory. And this is the beginning of dynamical systems. So let me describe to you what, what, what estimation theory does. So in regression, 
you have some X's that are your inputs, some Y's that are your outputs, and you try to find the map. But in a dynamical system, what you have is that you have some input, force, thrust, um, something. That causes the state of the system that you are interested in to change. And then you make some measurement that reflects some component of the state of that dynamical system. So this input that you give alters the internal state of a system, and then that system evolves in time, and as it evolves in time, you measure something about it. And in estimation theory, what we want to know is what's the relationship between this input that we give and these hidden states of the system. So I'll write a set of equations to describe this problem. So this is a dynamical system. And typically, we write our problem like this. So what this means is that x, the state of the system, at some time point n plus 1, some time point in the future, depends on the state at time point now, plus this input that I gave, u, at this time point now, plus some noise. This is the hidden state of the system. What I measure is y, which is related to this x and is also corrupted with some noise. And the problem of estimation theory is that if I measure y of n and have produced u of n, this is the input that I gave to the system, this is the measurement that I made, what is x of n? What's the hidden state of the system? So typically, the system will have many more hidden states than I can measure. I provide some input to it, it does something. I measure something from it. And both what I do to it and what I measure are noisy processes. And I want to estimate the hidden state. So in a dynamical system, the problem is state estimation. And the tool that is used to do that is called the Kalman filter, which gives us estimate of x from measurement y. And it's particularly relevant, you guys should really know the Kalman filter because Rudolf Kalman did this work here in Baltimore. So it's like, in a way, our forefathers before us did this work it really behooves us to understand it. And, and it's, it's one of the most important ideas in engineering from the 20th century, the Kalman filter. OK. All right. So the next set of ideas that we'll describe is Bayesian estimation. Let me describe to you what this problem is. So Kalman filter says, I will provide you an estimate of x given your measurement y. And what Bayesian estimation does is that it's related to maximum likelihood, but in the opposite direction. So let's go back to maximum likelihood. So here, remember, here's maximum likelihood. It says, I will find theta, the parameters of your system, to maximize the probability of observing the data that you did. But what Bayesian analysis does is that says, find the parameters of system theta so that you maximize the probability of theta given the data. So you measured some data, and you have some unknown parameters theta. Maximum likelihood does probability of data given theta. Bayesian analysis does probability of theta given the data. So what, what you really want, of course, is the probability of theta. You want to know how likely is this parameter to have a particular value given that this was my data. And so what Bayesian analysis requires you is to, you have to know what's the likelihood 
So this is the likelihood. This is called the likelihood. And we also need to know the prior. So we have to have some idea how likely is it that certain parameters have going to take on certain values. That's the prior value. And Bayesian analysis gives us a way to combine prior beliefs, how likely things are to have certain values. And now we made a measurement. Here's what the data said happened. I'm going to combine the two pieces of information, my prior belief with my measurement to form a posterior. And so this, this is called a posterior. So Bayesian analysis has a relationship to the Kalman filter. Rudolf Kalman, when he did his work, he did it without consideration for Bayes rule. And we'll see that his results map very nicely to what a Bayesian estimator would do. So we'll use Bayesian estimation to do classification with label data. And we'll see some typical tools that are used here, like Fisher discriminant analysis and Bayes classifiers. And we'll end this set of lectures with logistic regression. OK, so we're still, these classifiers are still in the framework of label data. So we'll do a little bit more sophisticated labeling with what's called support vector machines. And this is really what's called kernel-based learning. You're going to have basis functions that are going to be non-linearly encoding your input. And you still have labeled data. And that labeled data is going to be you know, learned. You're going to find parameters for your labeled data, but not a linear representation of your labeled data but a nonlinear representation based on kernels and support vector machines. So we'll have a couple of lectures that will teach you about this, 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 this technique. This ends most of what we need to know about labeled data. The next set of lectures are going to be unlabeled data. And that comes from a set of, a set of uh, lectures on dimensionality reduction. So basically here, you have data that doesn't have labels on it, and you, you're going to do things like clustering, principal component analysis, and so forth. PCA. So. Um, Dimensionality reduction is one of the tools that's used, and um, clustering is a result of it. And here's when we learn about an, an important algorithm called EM, which is expectation maximization. It's a very useful tool in labeling unlabeled data we will use it for both um, uh, dimensionality reduction and clustering. Also, we will use it for um, dynamical systems. And I'll describe that to you briefly. So let's go back to what we had done before with dynamical systems here. So we have a set of equations that describe dynamics of some system, as you see here. So in, in this dynamical system, you know this, you know the input to the system, and you know the output from the system. What you don't know are the states, and you may not know even these guys, the parameters of the system, A, B, and C, and the noises. So you have some dynamical system. 
You've given some input to it. You've measured some output. Here's the input that you gave. Here's the output that you measured. But you don't know its internal states and you don't know the structure of the system. You don't know these matrices that describe how the system evolves in time. So what we can do with the common filter is that if we knew A, B, and C, given input U, output Y, I will tell you how you can estimate X. But if you don't know A, B, and C, if you don't know the structure of the system, then you can't use the common filter. So what EM allows us to do, expectation maximization, is a way to estimate these parameters, A, B, and C, as well as the hidden state X. So it's really a powerful me mechanism by which we can do um, basically uh, system identification. You give some input X, sorry, you give some input U, you measure something Y, it's a dynamical system, you don't know its hidden states X, you don't know its parameters A, B, and C, with EM, we can uncover those things. So that's expectation maximization used for both clustering, which is you know, a simple form of it, and a more sophisticated form of it is to learn about dynamical systems. The final thing I want to teach you is optimal control. So again, our problem is we have some dynamical system where we have some states that evolve in time based on some inputs that we gave. There were some noises in that system. And we make some measurements that depend on those states. And the problem of optimal control is that how do I drive the system so y goes to some desired state? So you want to find the inputs U that then give you some desired, desired output Y. And that's the problem of control. Now what's special about optimal control is that you can specify goals that are only at the end of the process. So you don't have to produce a trajectory, you can just say, I want my system to end up at some location. How do I get it there in some way? And I mean, the, the, the typical example I like to give is that if you really learn how to do this, then in principle, you could set up a problem that says, I want to retire in Bahamas in 20 years. How do I get there? That's the kind of problems, in theory, optimal control can solve. Similar to things like, I want to win this game. How do I get there? So there's an end state that's specified. I want to be at some location at some time. And then what you have to figure out is how to interact. And typically, the problem is complicated because you have the environment. So when you do an action, the environment reacts to you. So you can't just be working in a vacuum. And so the problem of optimal control is intimately related to the problem of, you know, controlling systems that interact with the environment, playing games like chess and things like that, where you have an opponent, and so forth. And the fundamental algorithm for solving optimal control problems <coughs> is called the Bellman equation. And this would be the epitome, essentially, of our of our course. We'll get to the Bellman equation where we'll describe things like value functions and learning from um, our states. And um, you'll see that there's strong relationship between describing how to do optimal control problems and how we believe today, you know, our brain learns from problems like prediction error. You'll see how the problems of decision making of how to get to a long-term goal can be broken down mathematically for at least simple systems into a set of equations that 
can be solved, and then you can find um, uh, solutions for. So, so this is called optimal control, and the Bellman equation is is the um, the um, solution for such systems. And, and and I'll show you I'll show you how to do it. So that's our journey for the next three months. Everything that I think is cool and useful and important in engineering, I hope to teach you. So do we have any questions before I start with supervised learning? Yeah? So we're not going to go into detail for markup chains? Not so much, no, no. Yeah. Maybe there's a way to map some of the questions to the dynamical systems that we described, but not directly. I'm sure I will disappoint more than one of you guys. Yeah. Can we program in any language we want? Yeah, as long as, you know, as long as I can read it and Eson can read it, that should be okay. Yeah. All right. So let me, yeah, Eson. Dot at the corner, slide down, and then the other dot at the corner. Just one. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can. Cool. Uh, one that should do the work. It only goes up this much. Our pieces. Yeah, okay. that's okay. All right. Yeah, I have a bit of learning to do here myself, so. How is the how is this uh, so far? This use of this uh, this thing. It's okay. S yeah. Our lectures recorded as well. Yeah. So uh, audio is available. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. You know, we'll see if it's. You know, today is the first time, so we'll see if it's uh, the online version of it is going to be rec it's going to be decent or not. All right. So let's do supervised learning. I'm going to teach you today the perceptron rule. And our problem is a uh, simplified version of the kinds of problems that you might um, that you might see. So our feature space is x is a vector. binary. So every one of the elements in our vector is either 0 or 1. And our label for that vector, we're going to call it y, it's going to be either minus 1 or 1. So this is, if you want to think about it, the features of a movie. Either it has certain features or it doesn't. And either I liked it, or I didn't like it, sorry. Or I liked it. OK. So that's the problem that we want to solve. And we have some data that looks like this. We have x vector, and we have a label. We have another x vector. And we have a label. And we have n of these. OK. So our problem looks like this. We take our x vector. I'm going to put a weight sum these up find the sign of the sum and that's going to be my estimate 
So my estimate is W transpose X, where W is W1, W2, WD. So I'm going to make a prediction based on the sign of the sum, W transpose X. So Y hat is W1, X1 plus, sorry, I apologize for this. I'm going to have to fix that equation as well. OK, that's what I mean by that relationship. All right. So how am I going to learn to do this? And the, the idea is as follows. So suppose that the truth is, on a particular instance, the person liked this movie, and I want to know how I should behave. So suppose that this is the vector x. So x is a vector in some d-dimensional space, and w is also a vector in some d-dimensional space. And what do I mean by w transpose x? It's basically the projection of w onto x. And if it's a positive number, so this is a positive value here, then that means my y hat is going to be plus 1. So if y was plus 1 and my y hat was plus 1, I'm going to do nothing. But what if y was minus 1? Then what I should do is to change my weight because I, made a, I guessed that the label was going to be plus 1, but the truth is it was minus 1. So I got it wrong. So I should change. So I should add something to this vector. So here's the x again. Here's w. And what I should do is I should add a vector to my w that's parallel to x. And this I'm going to call delta, my delta vector. And my delta should be something that's proportional to x, the vector x, but in the opposite direction. So if I got it wrong, so y was equal to minus 1, and I had predicted plus 1, like, I, like you should see here, then what I should do is to add something to my weight. So my weight should become something w plus delta. And that delta should be something in the opposite direction of, of x. And so let's consider a couple of other conditions. We're going to do this until we come up with a rule about what to do. So what if? Under this condition, y was equal to 1, but what, what I had done was this. Here's x. What if my w was like this? So when I projected w onto x, I got this. So now my y hat is going to be minus 1. So I got it wrong. y is equal to 1. y hat is equal to minus 1. So I got it wrong. What I want to do is take my w, add to it, some component delta that's going to be in the direction of x. So here, delta is proportional to x. So what's the difference between these conditions? So in this condition, sorry, sorry in this condition, my y was minus 1, I predicted plus 1. So my error 
is y minus y hat. That's minus 1 minus 1. That's equal to minus 2, which is equal to 2 times y. That's my error. What about this condition? This also, I got it wrong here. So my error is y minus y hat. y is 1. y hat was a minus 1, so I get minus and minus 1, which is equal to 2. 2 is equal to 2 times y. So error is again 2 times y. So I get a learning rule. I say take w and add to it something that's proportional to y minus y hat along the direction of x. So here's a vector. This is a scalar. This is a vector. And I have a rule that says if y does not equal to y hat, then I should change my weight w by an amount that's proportional to the difference between the truth and my prediction, that's my error, along the direction of the vector x. That changes my w. If, on the other hand, y is equal to y hat, do nothing. So you can pick alpha here to be something like 1 half or something small. So this is called it's a perceptron. And what it's doing is that it's using error to change the weight always so that it is improving it for the next time. So if the truth was 1, but you said minus 1, it's going to change the weight so that it's parallel to x. If the truth was minus 1, but you said 1, it's going to move it in the opposite direction of x. And it does it via this, via this rule. OK? And this works for binary inputs, binary outputs. And you'll try it on your homework, hopefully, today. Yeah? What was the justification for alpha being one half? You want it to be something small. OK. Yeah, it's arbitrary. Yeah? How do you initialize the weights? Randomly. Yeah. Randomly small. Do we take into account the overfitting? Overfitting? Yeah. So. Um, there are ways to check for that. Um, one of the, we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, how, to, how to do comparison to see do you have too many parameters in the model, for example. Um, but at a, for your homework, what you'll do is that um, you'll do the following. So you fit one data point. So you learn from one data point, test on all data points, then fit a second data, two data points, test on all data points, and so forth. And you'll see that as number of data points fits, increases, this error will drop. Obviously, as you fit more data points, you can fit all the data points better. And you'll see how that how fast that drops. All right. Okay guys. Thank you so much.